I've got the chassis and power supply assembly from my DC1134A vintage computer stripped down. I've removed the voltage regulators, I showed those in an earlier video. And uh, I've actually now removed the uh, mains interface module. Um, I'm removed it because I need to clean it. I also need to replace the mains cable, there's some cracks in it and the insulation is starting to break up. Uh, but the main reason I remove this is I need to repair the main switch, it's broken and because of the type of switch this is you need to move both halves across at the same time so it's quite difficult to turn on at the moment and it's just one of the plastic arms has snapped off so I need to repair this um, and I decided it would be easier if I did that with the switch removed so I'm going to take the switch out and it's just a case of taking out the screws that hold in the contact arm, which is this large relay uh, taking out the screws that hold the main switch in. This will then lift up. I can separate them at the uh, contactor connections then I can take the main switch out and it will make repairing it much easier. And uh, I'll then repair, uh, replace the mains cable. Like I said it's starting to show uh, some severe cracking and uh, I don't want to push my luck with this and uh, either electrocute myself or blow something up. So I'll replace that. And uh, as I say I can then clean this uh, regulator card and uh, give it a quick check make sure it's all fine and then I can start to reassemble the entire chassis I'll clean the, um, the box the power supply box as well um, I'm not going to bother taking the transformer out that looks fine there are just four screws that you access from the underside uh, but I had a look at it and it seems fine I'm not going to take it out I will clean it with it um, in situ but it doesn't need to be removed I'll clean all the pins on the power supply connectors. Some are looking a little bit corroded, um, but just need a, a bit of a clean. And I've already cleaned the power distribution board. And uh, as I say, once I've done all this, I can start reassembling this, put the regulators back in, put the uh, mains interface module back in, and then we can carry on testing the boards. So I'll get this switch repaired and uh, see how successful that is. I've removed all the screws that hold the mains power switch in, I've removed the screws that hold the contactor in, I've unplugged it, at, uh, this is the um, external socket and um, what we can now do is lift this assembly out. Now I think someone's been here before me because these are the correct screws that hold the power switch in um, but uh, two of them were longer screws that had extra washers on, presumably because the screws were too long. So I think somebody's uh, had a go at this before, uh, unsuccessfully by the look of it, um, but hopefully we can resolve that. Um, now one thing, I'll, I'll be replacing the power lead, like I said, the original one's breaking up, the, um, the insulation started to dry up and crack, and it looks like you need a huge thick uh, mains cable for it, but uh, you don't when you look inside the internal mains cabling is very much thinner. It doesn't actually draw that much um, power in terms of current so it doesn't really need a massive mains cable. That was just really for uh, protection of the cable itself. So uh, anyway I should be able to now lift this out, which I can, to one side and uh, I can now more easily work on this power switch. You can see at some point it's been rubbing up against something or been hit. Uh, but I need to try and find a way to reconnect these. There's a fair amount of force goes through this, so um, I don't know how successful this repair will be. Uh, these switches are in pairs, so uh, you can split them if you want by drilling out these rivets and replacing half at a time. It's just a, a dual split switch. Um, but I don't have any spares of these, so I'm going to try and repair this. I'm going to remove uh, one of the circlips, pull out the pin, that will separate these parts and then I'm going to try and drill down into the uh, bottom part of the switch, drill into the top part, hopefully the holes will line up and then I'll put some, uh, what well, I'm actually going to use for this, if you try and use metal um, it won't really bond very well. Um, what I use is carbon fibre rod, so uh, t in this case it will be two, uh, two millimetre carbon fibre rod. I'll drill two holes, um, impregnate it with epoxy, the carbon fibre rod um, bonds very nicely to epoxy and it's very strong so hopefully that will make it strong enough to survive. Uh, bear in mind it was originally only a piece of plastic anyway so um, I'll give that a go. We'll see how successful we are and uh, 
see if we can get this resurrected. So I've drilled out the broken tab on the switch, I've drilled out the end of the lever and I've used a drill that was 0.1 millimeters bigger than the piece of carbon fiber I intend to use. That's for several reasons. Uh, one is because it enables the parts to properly line up if the holes aren't in exactly the right place, uh, but also it allows plenty of room for the epoxy to get in there. I don't want to kind of squeeze all the epoxy out when I push these two parts together. So uh, what I'll be doing is filling this with epoxy, uh, hold, clamping it into place, and then once it's had uh, a day or so to go off, I can put the crossbar back in, and hopefully that will be a permanent fix. So when I'm trying to operate the switch, it's actually the carbon fibre that's taking most of the kind of bending force and the epoxy is there just to stop the, the two parts separating um, but hopefully that will be a good strong repair. The as I say, carbon fibre rod, this is the sort of stuff you get from model shops and uh, cutting this if you're not familiar with using this um, if you try and just use uh, side cutters or, side, or shears to cut this it will just uh, essentially turn into kind of fluff so the way to cut this is to light on a hard surface, very sharp knife, and then just rotate it and it will eventually cut through without fraying. And um, what I can do now is put in some very thin epoxy, bond it all together. I can't repair the surround on the switch, you probably can't see it very well, um, but the surround on the switch is broken. Um, it took a major impact at some point. Um, what I'll be doing is holding this or clamping it in the upright position. I don't want to bomb the switch in the off position. Uh, I've got to be fairly careful. This one will break out very easily until it's epoxied and um, hopefully that will be a permanent fix. I haven't cleaned it up yet. As soon as um, the epoxy's had a couple of days to really fully cure, um, I'll just tidy up the, uh, the join so uh, it uh, will become pretty much invisible, it will look uh, good as new. Uh, I replaced the mains cable, the one that was on it had some cracks in it and uh, they're made of rubber and uh, it's a very good way of starting a fire to get some shorts uh, in a rubber cable and um, I actually also found that the um, output terminals on the contactor were fairly loose so I tightened those. The rest of it looks fine, cleaned up of course and um, the only other thing really I had to do was shorten a couple of the screws. Uh, two of the screws I think had been replaced and they were too long so there were some washers um, that had been put in there presumably because the screws were too long. So I can get rid of these two washers now. I couldn't find any uh, suitable screws so I just shortened the ones that uh, had been fitted. And uh, this is now ready to go back into the, um, the chassis tested the top regulator and that works fine, tested rug control but we knew it all worked anyway because I have run um, some of the boards uh, on the back plane. Uh, but one thing I did find uh, while I was working on the main part of the chassis was very interesting so I thought I'd share this. It's one of these things you find on some uh, old equipment sometimes and uh, it can be quite amusing and uh, sometimes surprising. This one's quite a funny one so uh, I'll just um, move the camera so you can see what I found inside this unit. So we're looking inside um, one of the two bays in the uh, main part of the power supply chassis and I don't know if you can see this or not um, but someone's drawn a picture of what I think is a, um, a wild cat in there. Um, I don't know when this was done, of course, it may well have been done um, as part of uh, manufacture. So somebody back at the DEC factory may have drawn this when this machine was made. So I thought it was quite amusing and it seems unlikely someone did this after uh, the event. Uh, it's quite hard to get in here when the machine's um, built, let alone draw a picture. So I suspect this was done by someone at the DEC factory. If you know who did this or if you drew this then uh, please let me know, but I thought that was quite a, an amusing find. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is bolt all this back together. Uh, I won't video it in detail to show you the finished result, um, but all I'm going to do is refit the uh, mains power box, refit the uh, three regulator boards or modules, and uh, this unit will be ready to go back into service. So uh, I'll get this reassembled. I had finished reassembling the entire power supply and I was doing a full power test on it. What I do is I attach um, some electronic loads to it. 
running it up to about 80% full power and I leave it running for about four or five hours. I uh, refitted the fans. I uh, wasn't videoing it because it's really noisy and um, it's kind of a boring test anyway. It's just to make sure that nothing is getting too hot. I use a thermal camera to monitor things. Uh, and I power cycle it a few times after that to make sure it's all fine before I start doing a uh, final reassembly. And during that final phase when I was power cycling it, it was intermittent and it wouldn't always switch back on. And uh, if you recall, I was using a small uh, switch as a uh, remote um, on off switch. I was leaving the main power switch turned on and cycling it with the remote control. Uh, but it wouldn't always come back on. It would turn on, it was intermittent, it would turn off, um, and then ultimately it wouldn't turn on at all. And so I started looking into the power control board. That's where the fault really has to be, uh, which is this board it sits inside the power um, input module. And it's a very simple circuit. So all that's really in here is um, there's a bridge rectifier formed with these diodes. It's fed from uh, mains inputs. So there's only three connections really uh, in terms of power. You've got uh, mains live and neutral coming in, and then one of the pins going out goes to the contactor solenoid and the other end of that um, contactor solenoid goes directly to the live wire coming in uh, on the output of the main switch. So it's very simple. Uh, the mains coming in goes through a transformer and uh, that's, as I say, using a full bridge rectifier creates a DC voltage, about 30 volts. Uh, and that is used to drive uh, an opto-isolated triac and that's turned on and off either through the um, power switch on the front of the machine or using one of the remote control sockets on the back of the machine. These are all wired in parallel so um, they're exactly the same, doesn't matter which one you um, you operate. Um, but it wasn't working and um, ultimately what I did is uh, rather than playing with this on the mains, what you can do is just connect uh, 30 volts directly across the smoothing cap from the bench supply, have it completely uh, isolated from the mains and uh, I was just doing a bit of probing around and um, it looked like the uh, current was going through to the LED side of the opto triode, but it wasn't turning the output on or off so I just temporarily tanked an LED uh, across the uh, input control terminals sure enough this turned on and off when I operated the remote switch but the um, power coming out never switched so I thought the um, opto tri had completely failed, so I decided to desolder it. And uh, while I was desoldering it, you're probably not going to be able to see this, but um, the pins are unfortunately folded flat by whoever assembles this, but you can desolder it and uh, straighten the pins out and then you can remove the opto tri from the board. But you probably can't see it, but there is no pin on this hole. And um, that pin is actually on the solder braid I was using to desolder. You may be able to see it's just here. So it looks like it's just corroded and come completely off the opto triac. So um, I'm going to have a look, see if I can repair this. It depends where it's broken off. If it's broken off flush with the case of the opto triac, I'll have to find a replacement. And uh, if there's a bit sticking out, I'll just solder a wire onto it and uh, resolder it. But I'll get this out and we'll have a closer look. Uh, I thought it was an interesting fault, so it was worth um, adding to the video. Okay, well, unfortunately the um, pin has broken off flush with the case of the device, so I can't really solder anything onto it. I could, of course, remove material from around the pin and uh, attempt to do it that way. Um, but I'm going to have a look for a replacement first. The only reason I'm not that keen on doing that is looking at the rest of the pins. They're also looking fairly badly corroded, so I don't think it's going to be long before they snap off. It's a fairly simple device, it's just an opto-isolated triac, it's just there to allow um, a degree of isolation between the remote control inputs and the uh, mains driven uh, contactor. So I'll look for one of these, see if I can find a suitable replacement and uh, move on with the repair. But I uh, thought that was quite interesting. Okay, I had a look at this under the microscope and the 
pin had broken off flush with the case but the case has kind of got a, a, a an extrusion where the pin comes out so it sits slightly proud to the PCB and it's about a millimeter so what I did was to get a very sharp knife and cut away that protrusion on the pin that had uh, or around the pin that had snapped off went about another half mil deep ended up with about one and a half mil of the pin sticking out and that was enough to allow me to nice and firmly solder uh, a new lead onto the device I checked all the other pins and there's a bit of corrosion on there that cleaned off with IPA didn't doesn't seem to go too deep so I'm going to try and reuse this one uh, they are quite difficult to get hold of and I didn't really want to modify the machine if at all possible so I'll get this resoldered to the board clean it up and uh, see if it's resolved the problem okay I have the device reattached to the board and uh, we'll hook it up and see if it actually now works again in the moment of truth we'll see if the contactor kicks in and it seems to work okay that's a successful repair I'll get this bolted back into the enclosure get this refitted into the chassis recheck it and uh, hopefully that's this uh, fixed it's nice to be able to reuse all components like this they are quite rare and hard to get hold of so if it can be repaired it's always worth attempting that so what I did was to cut away the material around the pin get a nice new clean piece of tinned copper wire form it into a loop bend the tail at 90 degrees to the loop so that it fitted nice and snugly over the little stub of lead that was sticking out solder it with plenty of flux clean it up and that should be quite a nice firm attachment so uh, as I say I'll get this uh, reassembled and uh, hopefully it will then still work I have the power supply chassis fully reassembled now I've got the mains input block reattached I've got the multimeter attached to one of the 5 volt regulator outputs so we'll try and power this up assuming we don't get any magic smoke appearing I should then be able to power it up using the remote switch and we should see 5 volts appearing on the multimeter ok so good so far no smoke turn this on and see what happens so 5.2 volts exactly what it should be it's a bit high um, because the uh, regulator is completely unloaded and as we saw when it was on test on the bench it does put out slightly high voltage with no load um, but that seems to be working as it should do okay so uh, that's it for this video in the next video we will move on to testing some more of the boards and uh, hopefully move closer to getting this unit fully up and running